Good morning, everyone. It seems as if we're meeting again this way. Maybe by next week it won't be that way. Our hearts are heavy this morning because we lost one of our own this week. Sister Judy Harris went to be with the Lord Wednesday morning. That is our pastor, Brother Michael's mother. And we will miss her. I will miss her terribly in my class. And I know the others will too. And our prayers and thoughts are with our pastor and his family today. Uh, but we know what Judy is, and that's the blessed thing. We know where she will be, where she is, and where we will be with her. Uh, today, we're still studying in the fifth chapter of Acts. Uh, we will begin with verse uh, 17, and there's a lot of verses in today's uh, lesson, so I will try to keep you informed as to where we're going to be. I hope you are home. I hope you are safe and well today. That's my prayer for you. Last week, we looked at the story of Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, and how they lied to God uh, and his church, and it brought death to both of these individuals. Uh, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John five sixteen about sins that lead to death. Now, there are sins that lead to physical death, and there are sins that lead to uh, spiritual death. We know what the spiritual death sin is, that, and that is the sin of unbelief. But in this case, this sin was grave enough in God's eyes to require the life of both Ananias and his, and his wife. You know, I wonder how many uh, funerals and how many churches would be busy having funerals if it weren't for this pandemic. If everyone that had ever lied to God suffered the same fate that Ananias and Sapphira did. That's something for us to think about. You know, after the death of this couple, there was a great revival throughout the land, and I, I'm sure there was. You know, after 9-11, we had a short revival. Right now, we're having another one. And I pray that our nation will turn to God and judgment will not continue to come. But by about 300 AD, the church now consisted of millions rather than just thousands. The great power that had come upon the apostles at Pentecost continued as healing was given to not only the spiritually sick, but the physically ill also. In fact, uh, there were so many that were brought to the apostles, especially Peter, uh, to be healed that they actually laid them out in the street with the hopes that uh, Peter's shadow would pass over them as he walked by, and just his shadow over them brought healing. This is amazing. Uh, we, we serve a powerful God, and sometimes we try to put him in a little box, and he is not that. But this spiritual anointing for the healing was given to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and it was given to the apostles only. It ended at the death of the last apostle, the apostle John. And this is where our thoughts begin today in the 17th verse of Acts chapter 5. Uh, as I said, there's 27 verses in this uh, section of Scripture, so hang in there with me, and we will try to pick up uh, the ones that are uh, the main verses of the lesson. But I hope you will read all 27 of those uh, verses yourself. Let's look at Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 17, and we'll read the first four verses, 17, or five verses, 17 through 21, or the first part of 21. Uh, now, remember the revival that was taking place and the, the preaching the apostles were doing everywhere. and Millions were coming to Christ. Now, this is what happens, and of course it always happens. Anytime God's blessing, we find Satan around real close. It says, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go, stand and speak to the people in the temple to the whole message of this life, capital L. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Notice it was the group of the priests called the Sadducees who were leading in this persecution of the apostles, uh, whereas in the persecution of Jesus, it was the Pharisees that led out in that persecution and death of Jesus. So, and there were more Sadducees in the Sanhedrin court than there were Pharisees, so they had a little bit more power. The Sadducees were more of a wealthy group. Uh, they were well known. Uh, there were not as many of them, but they had. They were very powerful. The Pharisees sort of continued to, uh, considered themselves as uh, the intercessor for the common man, where the Sadducees were a little bit more aloof than that. So what is really the difference and the beliefs and the teachings of this religious sect? Well, to put it in a very condensed form, the Sadducees adhered to only the first five books of the Old Testament, the books we refer to as the books of Moses. They were more a politically based group, no more than anything else. The Pharisees accepted the authority of all the Old Testament. Now notice, neither one of these accepted Jesus as Savior and the Son of God, as he said he was. They thought of themselves, as I said, the, the religious sect of the common man. But Mark, in Mark 7, 8, and 9, Mark says that they rejected the commandments of God in order to establish the traditions of men. We need to be careful that we understand the difference between what is tradition and what is doctrine. And sometimes we get those two mixed up, but let's be sure that in everything we do, in every ministry that we're in, that it is scripture-based and not tradition-based. Well, jealousy seemed to be the problem the, Pharisee, the Sadducees had with, with these apostles. So they arrested them and they put them in prison, or as in verse uh, 18 says, a public jail. They not only wanted to shut them up, they wanted to embarrass them as well. But during the night, an angel opened the gate to the prison and told the apostles to go back to the temple at daybreak and start preaching the gospel that they had been preaching all along. Now, in verse 21 through 27, which we're not going to read all of that, we see where the high priest called for the apostles to be brought to him the next morning in order to sentence them for their crime. This is when they discovered that the jail was empty and the apostles were gone and they were preaching at the temple just like they had been the day before or the night before when they were arrested. The unusual thing was that when the captain of the prison guards went to the prison to get the apostles, the doors were still locked and the prison guards were on duty. They were on their watch. But as they went inside, the prison was empty. The scripture says that they were perplexed. Well, you know, I don't know why. This had happened before, hadn't it? The stone was rolled away, not in order for Jesus to get out of that tomb, but for others to be able to come in and see the grave clothes, the headdress that he had folded and laid to the side. And just, but his body, he was gone. It wasn't to get out. It was allowing them to come in. Let's read verses 28 through 32, and we'll see what uh, takes place when the apostles are found at the temple and brought back to the high priest. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and have... And 
sorry, and intended to bring this man's blood upon us. They didn't like to be feeling guilty. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Let's put the emphasis here on verse 29. When Peter says we must obey God rather than man. Now Romans 13 tells us that we are to obey the government of our land for God is the one who put them there. So what does Peter mean by this statement? We must obey God rather than man. When man's laws contradict the laws of God, then we must obey God first, no matter the consequences. This, at this point, the religious leaders were so angry that they were ready to kill the apostles right then and there. But in verse 34, we see a voice of reason up here. Uh, verse 30, 34 says, But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, in fact, he was the teacher who Paul sat under all the time that he was uh, persecuting the Christians. Uh, uh, Gamaliel was the great teacher of that day. A teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. He wanted them removed. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. And he said to them, for some time ago, Thotus rose up claiming to be somebody, the Christ, and a group of about 400 Men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him, but he too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present care, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. Some people... For it, I'm sorry, let them alone. For it, if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may be found fighting against God. Scary thought, is it not? Page two. In essence, Gamaliel said, there have been others that have come claiming to be the Messiah. Where are they today? Well, they're dead. They're in the grave. Where are their followers? Who knows? They have dispersed and gone their own way. So if this is this, if this man, this Jesus, is the same as the other false leaders, false teachers, and, and false Christ that have come, it will, it will take care of itself. It won't be long before everybody will forget about him, and that will be the end of it. But if he is who he says he is, there is nothing you can do to stop this movement. And you will find yourself in a battle with God. You know, throughout the years, even in my lifetime, there have many who claim to be the Messiah. In the 20 and 21st century alone, and you can look on Google and find this, 
I found about over 30 men and women, not just men, who claim to be the Christ. Those names include some that we might recognize. Sung Man Moon, Moon, Jim Jones, David Koresh, and even Charlie Benson. The religious, gruders, the religious leaders took Gamaliel's advice, and after flogging the disciples, they let them go. Flogging. What happens to the body when someone is flogged? Well, the maximum lashes that could be administered with the whip made of calf skin and with a sharp stone or a piece of metal attached to the end of it. It is known as the cat of nine tails. The maximum lashes at the time of the apostles and at the time of Jesus was 40. Normally 39 lashes were given rather than take the chance of someone dying on that 40th lash. One third of the lashes were administered on the chest of the prisoner and the other two thirds on the back. Infection is the most common result of flogging. The loss of blood and water from the body causes inflammation in the internal organs uh, and, and that's what ends up killing them. There are 33 countries, and this astounded me, that still use flogging as a means of punishment today. There's even debates as to whether flogging should be reinstituted in some of these other countries rather than a prison sentence. In 2015, a Saudi Arabian man was sentenced to 1,000 lashes and 10 years in prison, and this was his crime. He looked at a blog online of a Saudi group that the Saudi government said were insulting Islam. That was his crime. He was sentenced to 1,000 lashes and 10 years in prison. These lashes were to be given 50 at a time over a, a long period of time. After the first 50 lashes, he was unable to be flogged anymore. You know, our Savior was flogged 39 times with that cat of dime tails. His back was, his back was bleeding water was seeping and yet they put a tree on his back that he had to carry up a hill and then be nailed to the apostles left their flogging as we see in the last few verses the, they left their flogging rejoicing rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for Christ's name. The apostles possessed within them a burning message about Jesus and his power to save, and they could not keep silent. We have that same message to share. Does it burn within us as it burned within them? Well, I'm sad to say it used to burn within me, to that degree, but as the years have passed and age has come on, I just don't seem to have that burning desire like I used to have. The message has not changed. The power that was evident in the apostles' time has not weakened in any way. And our Savior is still alive and he will return. He's not in the grave. Our, his followers may be fewer than they were at this time, but we're still here. And I wonder if, I've heard this said before, I wonder if we were accused of, and, and 
imprisoned for preaching the name of Jesus and teaching the name of Jesus, would there be enough evidence against us to convict us? That's a sobering thought. But we see that, that the disciples left rejoicing. Praise God. Praise God, that burning message still is a fire in the hearts of many. We're thankful for them. You take care of yourself. Stay safe. I love you all. I miss you terribly. And I hope I see your beautiful faces before long.